Hey, welcome back to Hustle and Flow Chart. Today we're talking with Ty Cohen, and you know what? Ty, I'm just going to let Ty go ahead and introduce this episode. Hey guys, Ty Cohen here. And listen, I just did an amazing episode on the Hustle and Flow Chart podcast with Joe and Matt. We talked about everything from Kindle Publishing to NFTs to the stock market to mutual funds to short term rentals to staying focused as an entrepreneur and so much more. If you don't watch this one, you are crazy. Awesome. So we have a really, really good one. You just heard Ty tell you everything we're going to talk about. So make sure you grab the notes on this one. If you go to hustleandflowchart.com slash notes, you can grab the notes on this one. And all of the little gold nuggets of wisdom that Ty shared throughout this episode are available in that action guide. Go to hustleandflowchart.com slash notes. Now let's go chat with Ty. What's up, everybody? You're listening to the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast with your boys, Matt Wolf and Joe Fear. All right, we're rolling. Ty, thanks for joining us today, my man. Man, I am excited. I'm, I'm ready to do this, so let's do it. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're you're one that's that we've circled for a while, and and Sharon Worsley got to give you another shout out. She's everywhere, man. She's so cool, and you were talking her up as well. So she made it happen for us today, and yeah, I I, I think you you just have an amazing story. You know, this crazy background. You know, like literally, like you know, getting past like death type experiences on, in hospital bed. I mean, it's crazy all the way from poverty to crushing it generational wealth all built on the back of publishing and your entrepreneurship endeavors man it's like it's super fascinating so we're gonna get you know i want to get some of that story but get into the tactics too of, of the kindle publishing that you do digital publishing but then how you're actually yeah. growing your wealth too on top of all of that i think it's gonna be a fun time man so yeah i don't know other than that man like how long have you been in the game i guess doing digital publishing because you did some stuff prior to that yeah, man, I've done a ton of stuff. So um, on the digital side, I'd say about 21 years. So wait, my daughter is 23. This is how I, this is my marker. Yeah. Yeah. So my daughter is 23. So I got started the year that she was born. So 23 years now. Nice. And I actually got started, man, selling like, you know, toys. Mm -hmm. So like online digital toys. Um, this is back when the AOL was around and mm -hmm. you had like directories and that was the, the flow of things. So selling like uh, G.I. Joe's uh, action figures. I'm heavily into comic books like Marvel mm. and DC, yeah. specifically Marvel. So I would sell a ton of comics and, um, you know, had a very, very interesting business. Right. That that did pretty well and then moved into a couple of other industries like the music industry. Got really passionate about trying to start a record label and being like the next, you know, Master P or yeah. Suge Knight, um, the good Suge Knight. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And selling digital digital products to musicians and, and authors um, kind of came around on the back end of that. Yeah. So what did, because uh, like Kindle Publishing, I know, is, is what you're known for, I would say, at least in the, you know, the entrepreneur business space. What got you into that? Like actually publishing in general like that? Yeah, so with Amazon, right? It, can you believe it? It's been like almost 25 years that Amazon's been around. That's Isn't crazy. that like nuts, <laughs> yeah, right? Crazy. So time flies. So I had a record label and started this label, put a ton of money into it, put a ton of time into it, thought I knew how to run a business uh, on the record label side because I had a lot of success selling toys and wind-ups. Um, long story short, I knew less about business than I thought. Mm. So I took everything that I knew about the music side of business and dealing with all, all, uh, artists and record labels and radio stations. And I started to put that in books. So I teamed up with my attorney, my label uh, attorney at that time. We created um, a series of contracts. So I pretty much hired him. I said, dude, listen, I'm going to give you $10,000. I want you to go in and write up these boilerplate template contracts for me. And then I hired a software company. And I had the software company take those contracts and put them into an editable format so that whether you're on PC or Mac, you can go in and as an artist or a record label, craft your own individual contracts. So I took that um, and those things started selling like hotcakes. Man. I was selling it on eBay, built my own site uh, through scratch, learning code and, and, and building it from the back end up, um, making all the mistakes that a traditional internet marketer would make now, like yeah. a black background with white text, which is crazy. <laughs> Uh, and then ended up just taking a lot of my knowledge that I had from the music side of things and created a series of books. So started self-publishing physical books. And at that time, Amazon had 
a division called Amazon Advantage, hmm. where as a publisher, you can ship books out to them physically, right? They would order 100, 200 copies, depending on what the demand was. And they would stock those books, and then they would fulfill the orders, handle customer support, everything else, and send you a check. It got to a point where we were selling like 10,000 books a month. Hmm. And it was just uh, me and my wife at the time. We're in our living room. We're fulfilling the orders. We're shipping these huge boxes off to Amazon. And I get a notice from Amazon, uh, one of their reps, and they were like, hey, we're starting up a new platform, a new division. It's called KDP, Mm -hmm. Kindle Direct Publishing. And this is basically going to be where people can buy uh, digital books, right? So Kindle books. And as an internet marketer, right, like we've always been familiar with the term ebook, right? Digital books, yeah. mm-hmm. PDFs, consuming digital content. But I thought it was the stupidest idea. <laughs> I'm like, listen, who's going to buy like digital books outside of the folks that sell to the masses? Right. And uh, man, it's the, the one time in life where I actually admit to happily being wrong <laughs> because that turned up, you know, being like this multi billion dollar business and we've done over like 50 million in sales so far um that's right with the with the program so yeah i mean it feels a lot like nfts right now where people are like why would people want to buy these digital (laughs) images but good point i don't know there's there's some roadmap there that looks pretty exciting but that that's a topic for probably later on in the conversation (laughs) absolutely that's my language now nfts right (laughs) you're all speaking the same language right now then yeah yeah i'm curious can we break down some of the 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 kindle process that that you work through i know there's probably a lot of nuanced things but maybe from a high level can we break down what that process looks like to maybe come up with the idea for the Kindle book and then how do you actually get eyeballs on the Kindle book and just for a little context Joe and I we have done some Kindle publishing Mm -hmm. in the past just kind of dipped our toes in the water and we've always found that it's kind of hard to get attention on the books right you've got to actively like really really market the books as well so I'm just really curious to hear the the sort of overarching high level concept of what you're doing yeah great question so so one of the things right so what I would get all the time is I would get business owners asking me to consult them and help them with their marketing. And I found out there was usually this one thing that most of them had in, in, in common. And that was they didn't really know the market. Hmm. And more importantly, they didn't know what the market wanted. Like they had these amazing ideas. They had a service. Maybe it was something that someone told them that they were good at. But they didn't go in and like do the research to find out, man, like what I'm great at or this product that I think is the next best thing since sliced bread Will the market support it by uh, wanting it, number one? And then number two, are they going to be willing to pay for it, right? So the first thing that we teach people is you want to make sure that you do your market research, right? So there's there's actually three core steps to this thing. So the first is market research. Like regardless of how good you think that your writing is or whether you suck at writing like me, like I'm so good with writing that I failed English 101 in high school, (laughs) not once, but twice, man. So English 101 spelling it twice because I'm an overachiever at that. (laughs) But I tell people like, listen, whether you're a writer or whether you're an entrepreneur, you're looking to get more visibility for your book or whether you just care less about writing and you you just want to create this passive stream of income. The first thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that there's a market there to support it. And um, even more so that there's an evergreen market, Mm -hmm. right? Because in internet marketing, right, we always hear that you want to go with the niches, Mm -hmm. which is fine sometimes. But when you want to make a lot of money, I found that like when you want to be like to the point where you're just continuously making cash to the point where it's hard to shut it off, you want to go where the markets are wide and where they're evergreen. Mm -hmm. Like they're not seasonal. They're not niches like fidget spinners. Mm -hmm. Remember the fidget spinners, right? (laughs) Sure. So that's the first thing. So we show people how to go in and conduct the market research and kind of model something that has already been a proven seller and that has perennially sold that's been selling for a while that will continue to sell for a while Mm -hmm. and that has competition as well so competition is good right so if you see that there's you know 10 12 13 14 20 30 other authors and they're all selling well chances are you jump in and if you know a little bit about marketing, you can take over the marketplace, uh-huh. right? Because most of them are writers, they're authors, and they care about that stuff. But the marketing, they don't put in place. Yeah. So the first step is the market research. That's the first thing, making sure whether it's fact or fiction, you go in, you spend some time on your market research using the processes that I show you. And then once you get that down, like it's like a no brainer after that. So is that like going after niches that are, you know, health, wealth, relationships, like the, the sort of big 
big broad ones that pretty much anybody wants information in anybody and everyone right yeah. so mm -hmm. if you think about anything that your mom may have been interested in in, mm -hmm. in the past anything that your dad may have been interested in the past your neighbor right uh mm -hmm. joe think about anything that matt might be interested in mm -hmm. matt think about anything that joe might be interested in and he's talked about it for like the last 10 years. <laughs> That's right. Right? So think about like cars. I'm into cars big time, right? Yeah. Have always been, always will be. So if you can come in and kind of find something that revolves around cars, then you can do well, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. So my son, Tyler, he got started with publishing when he was 15. He's 17 now. He actually just spoke at our live event over the weekend. Mm -hmm. And he makes about four grand a month publishing romance novels, dude, nice. like romance novels. Nice. Now, when I think about this, right, my mom, I remember being eight, nine years old and my mom like reading no romance yeah. novels, mm -hmm. right? Right. So, I mean, it's never going to go out of style. So um, I've got one of our students. His name is Peter Andre. He's. Uh, he just turned 20. He was 19, but he just turned 20. He's doing $33,000 a month publishing books around the topic of public speaking. Mm. Um, yeah. So he was very passionate about debate. And he was like at the top of his game in debate class in high school. And he just took what he was passionate about, put it into publishing and followed the steps that we provide. And he's killing it. So again, we've got people that publish uh books on the, the subjects of mystery thriller romance sci-fi yeah. um just everything and it just it just works when you follow the, the processes so right. it's 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 a, a mix of what it sounds like non-fiction fiction it doesn't really matter yeah. right it's just go for it so is it mainly ghost writers i'm imagining someone else to help you out with the writing and after you give them the format well is that the next step so if the first step is niche research and kind of figuring out the you know where you want to go is the next step finding a writer or writing it yourself or where, where do you go from there that's it so once you've locked in the direction that you want to go in right and i always tell people listen it depends on what the goal is so if you are someone because in our community it's about 50 50 hmm. meaning we have people that are diehard writers right but a journalist i spoke to a lady over the weekend she's like ty you know i've been following you for a while I'm a diehard journalist. I've been on all of these news channels. How does your model fit what it is that I'm looking to do? I don't want to hire a ghostwriter because that is one of the processes mm -hmm. here. So I'm like, write it yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, this is the perfect thing. If, if it's therapeutic for you, if you're passionate about, about writing, write it yourself. So 50% of the people that I come in contact with are writers. 50% are not. They're entrepreneurs, right? So they wear that hat. Mm -hmm. So if you are a writer, that's the next step. You nice. go in and you write your content and we show you how to flow it all out and everything else. If you're an entrepreneur, you're looking to drive traffic because you can use Kindle books to drive traffic to build um, a list where you're basically sending them up to your coaching programs, mm -hmm. your, your courses or anything else that you have. Um, or if you're just looking for this passive income stream, then that's the next step, which is going in and hiring an outsourcer, right? Mm -hmm. Someone to ghostwrite your content for you. Yeah, so, that makes sense. Yeah. It, this brings me back because back in the day, I had a partner, uh, Amish Shah, and I were uh, publishing. Oh, yeah. Do you know Amish by chance? Absolutely. Oh, Amish you is old school, man. <laughs> yeah. Over on the West Coast. Yeah. yeah, he's one of my best buddies. We're all in San Diego here. So I was partners with him, and we did iBooks for a long time. Uh -huh. And uh, that was for probably, well, it was like for like a couple years. But we had a little process. It was interesting. But like, would it's you know i know they're completely different environments but have you touched ibooks like as compared to kindle is there any kind of crossover with the strategies here yeah no i haven't touched ibooks honestly but one of the things i like about kindle books is if you do it the right way meaning if you set it up in a series format and again it works for fiction or nonfiction, but meaning that there's this continuous process let's say romance hmm. you've got a, a character that flows through to the next book to the next book to the next book to the next book and there's always a cliffhanger so what's your favorite television show? Give me a show that you guys like. Ted Lasso. Uh, walking. Ted, what, what is it? Ted Lasso. Right there. Yeah. Talk, okay. Talk All right. There you go. Right. So at the end of each uh, episode, there's a cliffhanger. Yeah, right. yeah. And you're like, so for me, it's The Walking Dead. Like mm -hmm. I am like net, like The Walking Dead is my show. It's like Sunday. I got to be there because last week they left off here and I want to know what's going to happen. So the same thing with our content. We leave people in a state of being in the cliffhanger mm -hmm. so that they want to go in and they want to read the next book and then the mm -hmm. next book and the next book. Now that works really well for fiction, right? Now, when it comes to nonfiction, 
you have just continuation. So people, if they're coming in and they want to learn something, let's say you want to learn Spanish 101, right? Well, the next obvious step is you want to get better at that. And that's Spanish 102, or if that's your course, or if that's your coaching, or if that's your training program. Mm -hmm. Or like I said, we just did a weekend event, right? For people that are interested in Kindle publishing, they want to know like, what's the next step here? And how do I take that to the next level? That's where I was thinking. It was like, yeah, there's always these next steps. It could be an opt-in, some way to get the lead, because that's why I brought up the whole iBooks thing. It's like, yeah, that was a lead gen thing too. You know, just using the natural traffic in the platform. That's where like my mind kind of shifted. It's like, man, there's a whole environment here that feeds the traffic. You know, and and you can get a reader and then carry them on once you have their attention and you kind of format yeah. the book in a way to to keep the journey continuing through. Well, there's an old, I think it's Dan Kennedy ism. Where he uh -huh. talks about how the easiest customer to get is somebody that's already bought from you, right? So it's like oh, if, yeah. if you put out For a Kindle sure. book and one person buys it from you, you've probably got a customer who's going to buy the next seven things from you after that. So that's really, really, mm. yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think most authors think about it from that approach. I mean, a lot of fiction authors do, but I don't think <laughs> most people that are publishing nonfiction think about it from that approach. Yeah. So one of the things that we we teach people is how to build their their mailing list first. Right. So a lot of our students have mailing lists of 10,000, 50,000, 60,000 people, because, again, no one's doing it. Right. And there's space. No one's also marketing in their space. So it's a one off sell. You come in, you buy uh, whether it's nonfiction or fiction. Usually that is a one off sell in the writer's head in the content creator's head. So they're not thinking about like, well, how do I sell this person into the next thing? Mm. Right. How do I continue to give value into the next thing? We also teach them how to build a community. Right. So that you have this community that's doing the selling for you as well. Yeah. So in our community, what's happening is, you know, I can mention a process. And so Sharon, Sharon Worsley, we both know. Right. Yeah. So perfect example. So Sharon is part of my community now because she's seen the results that a lot of the students get. She goes out and campaigns and tells other people. And now that becomes this continuous loop. So it's like the uh, affiliate marketing example. Right. Where you have like the first tier. And then you might offer second tier where you're giving 5% or 10%. Mm -hmm. Well, you get that. Like the first tier is the person that loves your content. They love your book. And then that second tier is the person that they've told. And then that person has went on and told someone else. So when you set it up the right way and you've got your funnel set up yeah. the right way, then that happens. Yeah. That's the power. That's the machine then, right? You're like kind of creating your own little platform within the platform. You know, like when, yeah. you, when you figure out how to get attention, you get them in there and you lock them in. So like, Big time. yeah, well, how about the marketing of these books? So I know Amazon, there's probably a million ways to market this, but like, are there, are there a few yeah. ways that you can recommend people to get attention? Yeah, absolutely. Things? So what we use is we use Facebook and we use YouTube mm -hmm. for marketing a lot, right? So Facebook is super easy, especially in some of these niches, you'll find that you have very little competition, um, even with things like the latest iOS fiasco that's been yeah. taking place with Facebook. So we use right. a process that is kind of called hit marketing, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're going in and you're testing three different elements at, a, at, at, at uh, separate times. So the first thing you're testing is your headline, right? You get your headline dialed in, then you go in and you test your image. You get your image dialed in, and then after that, you go in and you test your title. And then you come back and you combine all of those, and that gives you this Facebook ad that not only has an amazing click-through rate because all of these elements have been tested, right? They've all been proven to work really well. But it also gives you like high conversion rates on the purchase side or whether it's on the lead side. We always go for purchases over leads, yeah. right? Because we're looking for individuals that are comfortable with buying online, individuals that are going to buy over and over and over again. I found that sometimes with uh, Facebook ads, if you're just going for the lead side of things, you can get faked out because mm -hmm. you have people. Facebook is super smart. They know who's going to go in and register as a lead, right? That's right. So they'll send you a ton of those individuals. But if you say, hey, I want to optimize for purchases, then you'll get the people that will opt in as well as buy. So when we use this hit method to run ads and we teach our authors that they have a much higher success rate than someone who probably would just go out and run Facebook ads in a traditional way. So then what they're doing as well is it's Facebook ad to opt in where we give them a freemium, which is the first uh, installment of your book. It's going to be a very short version of it, five pages or so. Mm -hmm. just to whet their appetite, that uh, five page premium then sends them to your book on Amazon where they can actually go in and buy it. And now you have them on your mailing list. You've got them on Amazon. 
and you're just good to go. It helps to, that cycle to, to continuously repeat. Got yeah, it. Yeah. So you get the marketing from the Amazon enough over there, but really you're relying on your own form of marketing through, yeah. through emails and pretty retargeting if you can and all that stuff too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 100. percent I'm cool. curious. This is kind of a sort of like in the weeds question, but how how would you optimize for sales over on Kindle if if there's no way to track a conversion on Kindle, or maybe there's a way to track a conversion on Kindle, and I'm just not familiar with it. Yeah. No. So does that. So what we do is we teach our authors to create box sets. All right. So mm -hmm. primarily fiction authors. So what we're doing is if you've got a seven part series, remember I said you've got book one, book two, book three, right? Mm -hmm. So after you've published all of these books, you now put them into a box set. And that box set sells for a higher price. And that's what you're actually marketing uh, to your customers, right? Through Facebook okay. ads. So now you've got that purchase conversion on your box set. Thank you page there. Mm. So you're good to go. Now, now what about, what yeah. about pricing? What, what's the pricing strategy? Cause I know there's like Kindle unlimited, which there's like a, a pool of money available for people who put their books on Kindle unlimited. And you know, a, a yeah. long, there was a, a long stretch of people, uh, time where people were getting frustrated when Kindle books cost more than like two dollars you know th there's all sorts of things around pricing in kindle books and it, kindle yeah. pricing's always been a little funky so I'm, I'm curious how do you price them and what's the approach there yeah it's insane so what we find is first giving away that free book right and again it's going to be super short five pages something that's a uh, lost leader something that mm. gets people's appetite uh wet there and then after that we find that 2.99 is like a premium price there because it it's no biggie, right? Like mm -hmm. you're not thinking about, do I pay my mortgage this month or can I afford to buy right, this right. book at two ninety nine, right? So then at that point, once you have the box set, nine ninety nine works really well. So you can like nine ninety nine them to death all day long mm -hmm. to a point where people got a rabid fans and they're they're really hooked into what it is that you're selling. They want the box set. They're going to buy a lot more at that nine ninety nine. Um, sometimes we'll give them a premium when they come in and they buy the box set. Um, and again, this is something that you can even do for nonfiction as well. Mm. It just works both ways. Yeah. Do, do you so. find it valuable to turn on Kindle Unlimited or do you want the, the two ninety nine every time? Nope. Kindle Unlimited is amazing because you get a lot of people who, um, I'll give you an example, right? So my mother-in-law, we bought her uh, Kindle device uh, two Christmases ago and she just went in and just loaded it up, right? With Kindle Unlimited, right? Uh -huh. I forget my account was on that bad boy. Right? So <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> right. But she just goes in and loads it up. So now she's part of a Kindle Unlimited program as well, right? Through my account. So we have a lot of our students who just make bank by being in Kindle Unlimited through getting the page reads. I just uh, interviewed one of my students um, her name is Caroline Trainer. She's had a million page reads just over the last couple of months, Jeez. right? And she's enrolled in Kindle Unlimited and people are just loving it. So she's making more money now through Kindle Unlimited than she would through the actual initial purchase at $299. Wow. But the the but but part of that is now she also has longer books, right? Because mm -hmm. with Kindle Unlimited, you're getting paid per page read and the length of time that someone's actually in your book. So Instead of this being just uh, a 30 or 40 page book, now we're looking at 50 pages. We're looking at 60 pages, right? So it's always a balance between your market and where you're at and what it is that you ultimately want to do. So most people will go in and they'll um, enroll their books in Kindle Unlimited, as well as have that price point where there's um, a sell for people that are not enrolled in Kindle Unlimited on the other side. Yeah, that's, right. that's cool. And it, wow. and it makes sense too that it, you know, you make every chapter a cliffhanger now, right? Now, you, now you're going to oh, get yeah. them to consume deeper and deeper into the book as well. So you can do the same cliffhanger thing yeah. per chapter. That's it's like 100%. It's, it's like Netflix, huh? You just got to get, you know, they, it's all about engagement across the channels. I actually didn't know about that at uh, Kindle Unlimited, how you get paid. It's, it's through consumption. Yeah. I'm like, that's, that's yeah. pretty brilliant, actually. Yeah. yeah if you it's actually kind of similar to YouTube, right? It's like based too. on the retention numbers, yeah. how long people yeah. stick around with it. So, Are there any other yep. tips for, for writers to keep in t attention or retention within a book? I mean, you have the cliffhangers. I'm sure the writing yeah. style helps, too. So so I've got this method called the hook method, right? And Amazon has – have you ever been on Amazon and you look at a book and there's like this look inside tab at oh, the yeah. very uh -huh. top? Mm -hmm. where you can go in and preview. So right there, I tell people, like, whatever it is that you're writing, doesn't matter, fact or fiction again, right? Hook them in. Like, Amazon is giving you those couple of pages to, like, really preview the information. Like, don't be, like, calm there. Like, don't be modest there. Like, just really go in and talk about the characters. Talk about, like, their journey. Talk about, like, the crap that they get into, right? Mm -hmm. Talk about, like, what could possibly happen. And then also... 
Lee, did you guys, uh, I saw we had Robert Cialdini on yeah. one of the episodes, right? Mm-hmm. So Recently. Robert Cialdini, uh, the power of influence and persuasion was one of my, it's still to this day, one of my favorite books. So in there, he talks about like mystery. Hmm. So, and this is kind of, uh, leading towards the cliffhanger thing as well. Right? So if you start something off from a point where there's a little bit of mystery that's involved here, people have to follow through. Hmm. doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you are an A plus student or a D student, like mystery is always going to, the curiosity of it is always going to make you want more. So at the very beginning of your book, where there's that look inside feature, have some element of mystery that's in there, right? Mm-hmm. At the And Cialdini does this with his book, as a matter of fact. I don't yes. know if you guys read that one, but if you mm-hmm. go back to it, at the very beginning, he talks about, uh, I forget what the example was, but it's to the effect of there's one thing that helps people to get a 50% more conversion rate. And this is his, me, me doing the Cialdini yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, impression right there. There's this one thing that helps people to get a 50% more higher conversion rate if they make this one simple tweet, mm-hmm. you've got to find this one out, right? So he leads off with that. And then you're like, what the hell is it? <laughs> so now you're, yeah. you've got to read the rest of the book. You're thinking 50%. If I could only get 50%, that's got, all types of things are going through your head now, right? That's yeah. going to shoot my conversions up. I'm going to make more money. I'm going to mm-hmm. get more subscribers, more readers, yep. right? So mystery at the very beginning and being able to position it the right way at the very beginning of your book so that you can take advantage of that look inside feature. I know that was mm-hmm. the longest heck. Oh, that's uh, perfect. Answer. I love but it. That's it. I love the reference to Cialdini as well because <laughs> there's so many things you can do. And like you said, yeah, if you just tease him a little bit, yeah, it's almost like a pre cliffhanger, I guess, you know, and it's like your yeah. mind just starts doing all the things, you know, the bells and whistles are going off. Like I got the find the answer, man. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's powerful. How about more tactics, man? Are, right, there, yeah, are there any I, others? I mean, I he's think a tactic we... guy right here. So I want to, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking through my notes and I think we kind of covered everything. Is there anything about the Kindle stuff that we haven't really talked about? That's kind of a, a key to this that maybe we're brushing over. Yeah. Yeah, so we talked about so the steps, right? So I, I mentioned that there's three steps. So the first step is doing your market research. I think that's where a lot of people kind of make mistakes at, right? Oh, yeah. So they put a lot of effort into the content because we, we think that, hey, listen, if the content is great, and I'm not saying that the content should be great because it, it, it must be phenomenal, mm-hmm. but their focus is on the content only instead of looking at the market. So number one, conducting the right market research and spending time there, making sure that you're looking at your competitors, making sure that you're looking at uh, the bestsellers rank of your competitors. I found that if there's a BSR bestsellers rank of less than 20,000, and you can kind of find this when you go on Amazon and you look at a book and you go all the way down to the left-hand side, you'll see where it says bestsellers rank, Mm -hmm. right? So for the main category, if your BSR is less than 20,000, then that's a book that sells extremely well. If it's higher than 20,000, then that's a book that you probably don't want to go in and, you know, and model and, and, and get into that category. Um, but the way Amazon does it is they don't give us exact sales numbers. So they won't say, hey, this book has a bestsellers rank of 19,000. That means it's selling 500 copies a month, right? But through the magic of algorithm hacking and a few other things, we can kind of get an idea as to what a book's selling and um, you know, how frequently they're selling based off the bestsellers rank. So look at your bestsellers rank. Look at books that have that BSR of less than 20,000. Also look at books that have a price point attached to it because Matt, you mentioned something that makes sense, right? So when you look at Kindle Unlimited, when you're going in and doing your research, for most books, you'll see a couple of tabs at the very top. Mm-hmm. It'll be a tab for the paperback version. It'll be a tab for the audiobook version. If there's an audiobook version, there'll be a tab for the Kindle book version. You want to make sure that there's price points that are attached to each of those. Mm. And the reason why is when we're doing our market research, we want people that are not just looking lose that are going into uh, Kindle Unlimited and just downloading the book. But we want people that actually buy, right? Mm. Whether they're buying the audiobook version, whether they're buying the Kindle book version or the paperback version or something. You want there to be like enough buyers. So with enough buyers, the other thing is when you're doing your market research, right? So there's, there's three criteria. The first is making sure that your bestsellers rank is 20,000 or less. The second is making sure that there's a price point attached. And then the third is making sure that there's at least 500 reviews mm-hmm. for that book that you're considering jumping into that market of. 500 four-star reviews. So like not 500, like two-star, mm-hmm. one-star reviews, um, not 500 or not 100, you know, uh, four-star reviews. 
So because that helps us with the demand as well. Now, when you're looking at the reviews, here's how you go in and you put together phenomenal content. And again, this works for both fiction and nonfiction. Look at the reviews. If you see a book that on average has about four star reviews, look at the negative reviews and look at the positive reviews. The negative reviews will tell you what you should not do with your book and what you shouldn't slack on. So if you're reading, let's say, give me a topic, anything. What do you guys think? Uh, how about investing? Uh, that's All right. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So if you look, you're looking at, so we're in the short term rental industry as well, right? So if you're looking at a book that deals with short term rentals, Airbnb, variable, and the uh, negative reviews are saying, well, the guy didn't talk about how to set up your Airbnb account, didn't talk about how to set up your variable account. Well, dude, if you got a book that talks about short term rentals, make sure you cover how to set up your Airbnb account, your verbal account, yeah. especially if you see complaint after complaint after complaint, right? And negative reviews that deal with that. And by the same token, look at the positive reviews and the things that you see consistently that come up. Well, here he talked about all of the coolest restaurants. Yeah. He also included like a rating of all of the coolest restaurants. Well, guess what you want to have in your book? Mm -hmm. Like not only a rating of all of the coolest restaurants, but also like the theme parks that are around, you know, like the movie theaters, the shopping centers and everything else, right? Just go one step above. Yeah. So that's how you really go in and you um, create content that is going to sell not only long term, but that's going to sell really, really well. Yeah, that's yeah. what I love about Amazon is like you can you can model from so many out there and they, they basically put it all out there for you. And the reviews are gold. I mean, for anything. Yeah. And, uh, and actually, another yeah. Chaldini thing that stuck, he was saying that the the most trustworthy or the best sold things have ratings of about 4.8. I remember that. And I was yes. like, that's interesting. But that applies here, yeah. you know? 100%. It's not fake, right? Because we no look way. at that, we're always wondering. Like, think about it. How many times have you gone on Amazon or anywhere and you've seen the reviews, and if it's five stars, mm. you're like, there's no way. The guy's got to be buying reviews, totally. right? Yeah. And then if it's three stars, you're like, eh, I don't know if I want to yeah. be a sucker, right? <laughs> so. Yeah. It's got to be right there, right there. And at four and a half, four point eight, right? Yeah. You're all in. You're like you're, you're sold. That's right. So, yeah. yeah. That's now, you, you mentioned something else a minute ago too that, that got me curious. Do do you do anything with the physical side? I know I don't. It used to be called Create Space. I don't think it's called Create Space anymore. I think that all got rolled into KDP. I think. Um, but do you do anything with physical books or the the audio version of the books? Like if a book really takes off, do you go and and make those versions as well or? You know, what do you yeah. do with that stuff? Yeah, 100%. So here's what I tell my students, right? So once you get a book that's doing well in a Kindle format, the easiest ways to make more money is, number one, go in and create an audiobook version of it. You can go on Upwork. You can go on Fiverr. You can go on Guru, all of these freelancing sites, and hire someone to record the audio for you. So I find, like, if I've got a 30 to 50-page book, I can pay someone about 150 to $200 to record that to audio, mm -hmm. chapters broken down, wave files, MP3 files, everything, right? So mm -hmm. you've got everything nicely in sync. Uh, this, so that's the first thing, audio book, right? Take your best-selling Kindle book, turn it into an audio book. Then the next thing is take that book and turn it into uh, another language. So have it translated into mm -hmm. Spanish. Smart. So Spanish is the language that I start with first, right? Second mm -hmm. largest language sure. on the planet, language on the planet. Same thing. You can go up to uh, Upwork. I usually use Upwork. I love Upwork. I use Google as well. But Upwork is like my go-to because you can find people that are proficient in Spanish, uh, native Spanish speakers, and have them translate your book. You can also go in and use like Google Translate. There's a ton of mm -hmm. other softwares out there. But I find that, you know, it's really iffy. There's nothing better than actually getting someone that knows the language, knows the dialect and paying them to do it, right? And then oh, yeah. you can go in and push it through one of these automation programs. And then the next thing, that third thing is going in and having a print version of it created. So I always start with audio books first, and then I always go straight to Spanish, especially when yeah. you've got a book that's doing well. It's smart with the languages. I mean, I know that's the case with digital publishing in general, like courses, uh, yeah. like we're chatting with um, just some people in our mastermind, and they're like, yeah, that's one of the biggest things is like there's companies that even do that for you for courses, but Spanish is usually yeah. the one, you mm -hmm. know, is that next step. Um, yeah. I was actually curious about like in terms of AI and, you know, tools like Jarvis and stuff like that. Do you, have you ever played with that in terms of like, creating a narrative or kickstarting a story? No, but that's next. Ooh. So that is definitely next, man. One of the things that I do do is um, we use services like, you guys heard of Rev.com, oh, yeah. right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
so rev uh and then you can use like google google has a version of you open up google docs so speech to text oh yeah have you ever heard of the marketers cruise oh, yeah. Mike, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. For sure. yeah okay so i've been going on a marketers cruise for i don't know forever for 15 years or so and uh was asked to contribute a couple of chapters a few years and then there's one day when captain lou he asked me hey ty can you contribute a chapter and oh by the way I need it within the next three hours. <laughs> I'm like, Lou, this is like, Come this on. is not going to happen, right? So I'm going to pick my son, Tyler, the same one who publishes the romance books to Amazon. I'm going to pick him up from football practice. And I got there early. So I had about 20, 25 minutes before he got out. I picked up my phone, dude, and I'm starting to speak it. Yeah. So I start speaking speaking the content and having it transcribed using rev.com. And before you know it, within the next two and a half hours, I had more than that chapter Mm. that I needed, right? So in 20 minutes, I was literally able to speak it, send it over to Rev, send that audio file over to them. They transcribed it. I went in, spent another 15 or 20 minutes just updating it. And that's the chapter of it. So I tell people who are professionals, who are proficient in like their industry, who know their stuff, like, if you can talk about your subject matter in your sleep, go in and just speak it to text, and you've yeah. got an entire book there. Yeah. Otter is another great tool. I, I've done that a lot. I like the, the Rev thing because the, you actually get the human touch to help you transcribe it, yeah. maybe even format it a little bit for you, too. Mm-hmm. And it's not, you yeah. know, it's inexpensive. Oh, that's smart, man. Yeah. I think for that, for, so for that, that chapter was like 18 bucks or so. <laughs> Like, come on you're sitting in your car I mean, waiting doing you know killing time and and there you go you just created awesome. content yep that's the way that's it and it's a net time right so it's no yeah. extra time net time you would have been sitting in your car probably goofing off doing uh-huh. something unless you're watching like the hustle and flow uh podcast. <laughs> there you go then that's good that's good time invested <laughs> yeah. but if you're just twiddling your thumbs on twitter right then i mean you've got time to go in and create your content and For then sure. It's another another stream. Where I, I wanted to go from here is I wanted to kind of shift a little bit and talk about the bigger picture. Like, oh, what, yeah. you know, what what's next? What, when you start making decent money off of Kindle books, what do you do with that money? And I know this is something you've talked about on, on some other podcasts. And I know it's something that you said kind of lights you up is the, the investing yeah. side. How, how do we actually grow the wealth that we're, we're making off of Amazon? So, I mean, maybe a good starting point is is what are the what, what are a handful of sort of investments and and places that you put your money you know what even before that like i want you to set the stage ty a little bit from just quickly like your background because you're like the way i see the way you're doing this and bringing your kids into this like bringing your son into real estate deals and Mm -hmm. having them see the lawyers and the all the you know the the, man you've done your research yeah a little bit you know that's what we do (laughs) i love this stuff but like you came from crazy like in what connecticut right in the projects he's like it was a gnarly story and I probably don't have time for it, but I just want you to set the stage of how you're like literally changing the legacy of your family and probably so many others too. Yeah. Yeah, So when you think of Connecticut, right, you think cows and pastures, but actually, man, I grew up in Father Panic Village in the eighties. This is when crack and heroin was like proficient. And like, I seen so many of my friends get killed by being in gangs, getting arrested, just, you know, this is a very, crazy life mm-hmm. right um at that time uh father panic village the, the, the town that i grew up in which was bridgeport connecticut had the highest murder rate per capita mm-hmm. of the entire united states oh, wow. Jeez. in connecticut right which is crazy like you had guys that would come from some of the toughest projects in new york because new york is uh, 30 minutes away mm-hmm. that would be afraid of coming in this area where i grew up at Whoa. um so it, it it's all about just changing you know, the late Wayne Dyer used to say, when you change the way you look at things, the things that you look at change. Yeah, perception. Right? Yeah. So when you change, the, it's all about perception, 100%. So you could say, like, damn, my circumstances that I'm in right now are the reason why I'm in the crap that I'm in right now and the reason why my future will continue to be this way. Or you could say, man, the circumstances that I'm in right now, like, I have the ability to change it. Mm. Like, it just starts with, like, making a freaking decision. I don't know how. The, the one thing that I would say to my wife a lot is, I don't know how the hell we're going to do this, right? Mm. But it's going to happen. Yeah. Like, I don't know. You, you guys, you listen to 50 Cent's, right? The mm-hmm. rapper. I don't know uh-huh. how much you're into uh, 50 or not. For sure. But yeah. one of his highest selling albums was Get Rich or Die Trying. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right now, but the title might fool you a bit. It's like Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill's mm-hmm. Think and Grow Rich. The title might fool you, 
But basically, he was saying, I am going to make it regardless, yep. right? And that sometimes you have to have that mentality. You have to say, I'm going to make it regardless. And not only am I going to make it, but I'm going to make it to like the next level. Yeah. So that anyone that comes behind me doesn't have to go through the same craziness. Like I put a post up on Facebook that said, if you are misusing the time and opportunities that your ancestors didn't have, you're doing yourself a disservice. That's big. That's huge. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. think about it, because yeah. regardless of where we come from, right? Yeah. Your ancestors didn't have the same opportunities. Like, they didn't have this ability to, what are we using, Riverside? Like, yeah. they didn't even know what that what's was, it, right? What's this? What's video over monitors? What the hell's a monitor? Just like internet in general. Yeah, internet. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, 100%. So, like, just if so many of the things that we use uh, on a regular daily basis that we take advantage of, like, man, like we could use this stuff to really change lives. Hmm. The event that we did this weekend, a three-day event, we had people that came in from over like 70 different countries all over the place and just changing lives. I had a young lady that came on and she literally was in tears. Hmm. We did our gratitude circle and she's literally crying because she got exposed to something that has changed her life, right? So hmm. it's this continuous circle of giving back to people and then those people reaching out to other people. It's kind of what we talked about at the very beginning, yeah, right? Yeah. With Sharon Worsley coming into a community and knowing you and saying, hey, I got to introduce you to this guy yeah, and this guy does, and this guy to that circle. She's like, this yeah. is what I love is connecting and making stuff happen. She's like, that's all the thanks is yeah. making it happen. Yeah, but yeah. 100%. But um, Matt, going back to your question. So yeah. yeah, so taking this, right? So the biggest return, I love investing in everything, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of an addiction, just playing around with all types of stuff. But the biggest returns I've always seen is putting money back into your business. Mm -hmm. So putting money right back into your business, especially if you have something that's working, right? So one of the biggest problems that we as entrepreneurs have is we'll stop doing something simply because it works so damn well, <laughs> right? Crazy. Like, because we want to chase the next thing, right? I was, I remember having a conversation with Matt Ford. You guys had uh, Rich Sheffrin, oh, yeah. uh, right? So, oh. right? So, Mark Ford, yeah. It's um, the OG. You yeah. Know, yeah. The OG, right? Uh -huh. The old OG, right? <laughs> yeah. And this was a couple of years ago, and we're talking, and I was asking them about something that they were doing. I forget what it was. It was um, something that they were doing on the Agora side mm -hmm. where there was a, a um, financial newsletter that was grossing crazy numbers. And just out of conversation, I'm like, dude, how come you guys are not doing that anymore? Mm -hmm. He was like, I would just work too well. <laughs> right? Wow. And we got to talking like that's the entrepreneurial journey right there. Like that's the that's the gift and the curse of being an entrepreneur is we come up with these ideas, but the ideas are often our downfall because we don't stick with the things that are working long enough for them to kick off. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if, mm -hmm. if that makes sense to it does. So I always tell people like if you have something that's working put money back into your business, like growing your team, growing your community, like reaching out to your customers instead of chasing the next thing first. And then after you get that like 100% dialed in, then you can go in and start chasing the next thing. So for us, the next thing was um, getting into real estate, mm -hmm. right? So I've always been on the side of investing in stocks, mutual funds and all of that, but mm -hmm. real estate was like a totally new challenge here. So we're actually sitting in one of our properties here. I'm gonna show you guys around if oh, you sweet, can. Maybe oh, nice. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Um, yeah. But so like this one came in and we're actually on the beach. Let me see if I, if, if I, I shouldn't, I should be okay. But so the beach go. is here, right? Damn. Beautiful. There you That's go. That's amazing. Got people on the beach right there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I got my cool neighbor over here. <laughs> he, he just, he just got back from the mountains actually. That's what I that is. Mind. So like these properties here now, we go in and we buy, we got three cabins that we're having built right now. They're under construction in the mountains and uh, smoke in the smoky space. Yeah. But these properties, right? You continue to learn how to invest money in passive streams or semi-passive streams of income that are not going to take a lot of time from you. And that's also going to provide you with enjoyment. I think that's the key. Mm -hmm. So wherever we buy a property, it's in a destination area. It's a destination property where uh, it's paying the mortgage several times over. Mm -hmm. It's a continued investment. So now as my kids get older, we can pass that on to them. And it's something where there's always been this history of people traveling to those destinations, right? So destination properties where, um, especially now during COVID, mm -hmm. they have to be in areas where people don't mind driving to. 
So think about some of the things that you've always thought about doing, right? And that you've always considered to be fun. And then how can you monetize that in a way where it's not going to be intrusive to your time, mm -hmm. right? So that's the first thing that I, mm -hmm. I, I would say. Well, that's the second thing. First thing, putting money back into your business, continuing to grow it. Second thing is doing things that you really enjoy that can be turned into passive income streams. The third thing is just your traditional uh, investment properties, right? Like stocks and mutual funds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the safe stuff, I like to call it safe because you'll put money into it. And, you know, if you have a business on a digital side where your return is crazy high, mm -hmm. right? Your overhead is insanely low. When you're looking at investing in a traditional market, like the stock market or mutual funds, you're like, mm. <laughs> you're like, right? You I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're like, what the, uh -huh. but St like that has had been a mental roadblock of mine forever. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you mean I'm going to go put money in this and they're going to give me 2% back or 8% sure. or 12% back? But it's safe, right? So again, it's it's safe. So that way when you're 80 or 90 years old, uh, if you don't want to, you know, <laughs> do events or a coaching program or whatever it is, you have that option of doing so. Yeah. And then the third thing is some of the more risky stuff that's fun. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I got my numbers wrong. The fourth thing, <laughs> risky things that are fun. So for me now, Matt was talking about NFTs uh -huh. and which I'm just learning about a lot more, uh, cryptocurrency, right. Mm -hmm. Um, got bags and bags and bags of crypto. Some that are safe. I apply the same philosophy, right? Like the Bitcoins and the Litecoins and Ethereum things that I know that are going to come down. Like the market's kind of down now, but I always yeah. know that they're going to come back up. And then you get into some of uh, some of the more risky, you know, like the XLM, the XRP, uh, mm -hmm. and depending on who you're talking to, right? You got diehard XRP fans who are like, XRP is not risky. <laughs> right? so, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> did did down, Joe I've... just look at Matt when I said that? Yeah, <laughs> he's the crazy one now. No, that's actually stuff I haven't gotten into. Yeah. Um, I actually don't know about those. So that's, that's all well, fresh. Well, XRP is Ripple, I believe. That's Ripple. Yeah, never... that's right. Yeah. Nothing I've ever played around yeah. with. But. No, no. We used to do a bunch <laughs> of other coins. But how about NFTs and all that stuff? Have you, are you just learning about those, you said? Bro, so I'm just learning about it. So I was just talking to my team a couple of weeks ago who are hugely into, is that even a word? Yeah. Hugely, <laughs> sure. right? It's, it's a word now. Yeah. That are hugely into crypto, the crypto space. So I got guys that literally, and, and listen, so I'm putting this out there for anyone that's watching. This is not the norm. <laughs> But they took like 80 grand and turned it to like 1.5 million, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. In less than a year. And again, that's that's an anomaly, right? Sure. So I don't want anyone to No like financial advice here. Yeah. All right. Yeah. No financial <laughs> advice at all, right? Because my insurance doesn't cover it at all. No <laughs> 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 Yeah. But so, so just talking to my guys um, who are on my team about creating an NFT version of one of our Kindle courses mm -hmm. and being able to pass that down through the uses of smart contracts mm -hmm. so that someone that comes in and they buy are you guys familiar with how a smart contract oh, yeah. And yeah, yeah. NFT you can works? explain okay, it though okay, I mean it might help some folks yeah if you want yeah absolutely so right having a smart contract with an NFT paired together allows you to go in and sell that NFT let's say if I've got a digital version of the Kindle cash flow course. Let's say this is a digital version. We're going to use our imagination. We'll mm -hmm. go back to being eight years old here. Yeah. And then I sell this over to Matt for 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. Now, because we've got the smart contract in place, I say, Matt, you now have the ability to go in and sell it to Joe, but I need to get 5% or whatever we agree on in my initial smart contract of that sell in perpetuity, mm -hmm. right? So Matt sells it to Joe. Joe sells it to Robert. Robert sells it to Linda. Linda sells it to Jill. I get 5% off of each of those cells mm -hmm. and my wife is happy as hell. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> You're a genius. <laughs> that's the power of smart that's contracts. It. And yeah, you can apply that across the board. And that's where it's interesting. The utilities of these. And when you start getting creative, like oh, the man. courses, I know we, we talked about it's just scratching the surface. There was, yeah. there was one um, thing that I was reading about yesterday. Um, I, I can't remember the actual name of the, 
the, the token that's attached to it. But basically, it's this idea that you stake money in exchange for getting access to something. So, mm. for example, let's say your Kindle course. Somebody can go and pay like $1,000 to get access. I'm just making up numbers. But somebody can go and pay $1,000 to get access to the course. While, while they're taking the course, that money is staked with you, and it's earning a return for you. Let's say 12 13%. Right, so they pay a thousand dollars. You're earning twelve, thirteen percent off of that thousand dollars. And when they decide they're they're ready to be done with the course, they can actually pull their yeah. money back. But you made just as much, if not more, than you would have anyway, because the money that they were staking with you was actually getting you an ROI while they were with you. And then when wow. they finally cancel, they actually are out of pocket nothing. They pull their wow. money back, and you made money along the whole way. They got educated along the way, and they supported you by staking money with you. That concept to me, I was kind of going down a YouTube rabbit hole yesterday about some of the, the people that are building that, and that could be some pretty insane next level stuff because it removes the risk out of the consumer, but the vendors are actually still making the money off of the content that they're creating. And that to me is a really exciting concept. It's insane. I mean, that that's beautiful, right? Because what happens is, now it serves a few for purposes. Number one, the vendor is getting paid, right? The mm -hmm. consumer is getting access to the content. But now we're also incentivized to consume the content because they're going to get their money back. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens like you guys, you guys sell products, right? Yep. Or you've yep. sold products in mm -hmm. the past, right? As the, as the content creator, especially if you have other products on your back end, you want people to complete your course Dang, and right. to get results because that means that they're going to want to go in and get more of it, especially if your stuff is worth anything, right? Yep. So like, that's a beautiful model, man. I'm, I'm, I'm truly interested in that. But I tell people all the time, I say, listen, one of the biggest problems that entrepreneurs also have, I got this entire list of biggest problems, right? <laughs> yeah. um, that is the staying focus. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see so many different opportunities that can kind of pull you off your horse and your horse might be running in the right direction. And then you, you know, you get, um, you, you kind of get the shiny object syndrome and you're moving into the other direction. So yeah. it's, it's like really going master your thing. And when I say that guys, I'm talking to myself as well. <laughs> Right. I'm like, hey, stay focused because there's so many different opportunities. Yeah. Like you hear like everything sounds great. Uh -huh. And I'm I'm of the mindset like everything can make you a multimillionaire. Sure. Like everything. Yep. Yeah. Right? Um, if you put the the hustle in, if you put the dedication in and you totally submerge yourself in it, I think everything works. But it's like, okay, well, what do I put my time into? Because we we literally only have, you know, I sleep six hours a day. That gives me 18 hours a day, mm -hmm. right? So we literally have 18 hours a day. And then you got other stuff that you got to do. So it's not much. It's like, yeah. what, right? Mm -hmm. It's true, man. So that's it. So it's go deep. So now that anything, you know? your, boy, your boy Matt over here <laughs> has got me now thinking about this <laughs> NFT-based course program. Hey, I'll send you some resources. <laughs> this yeah, guy is I'm a like... source of knowledge, man. So how it works is I hear this every day from him, but he like distills. He's like, all right, I just watched like 50 videos. Here are like the two you got to watch. I'm like, cool, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, this but... is what I mean about focus, right? Because... I don't know if you guys were able to tell just now, but as you're talking about that, Matt, I'm looking for my phone I saw, to yeah. try to go take a message real quick. Yeah. And then I had to drill myself back in. I'm like, no, stay it. Stay, yeah. stay tuned in. But that's the gift and curse of an entrepreneur, right? Yep. Like, yeah, everything is, everything is good, man. So, it's opportunities. You know. Hey, I want to go back really fast to the traditional investments when you said, like, you always struggled with uh, the smaller returns, you know, and, and mm. it probably took you a while. You're probably out of the game. Like, was there something that shifted your mindset there? to go all in on the long term. Yeah. So I, I got a cousin, um, we call him Lenny the boss. He's part of our community as well. And he's in real estate big time. Right. So, uh, long-term mm -hmm. rentals and we've been partnering, uh, considering partnering on some short-term rentals, but he's always like, Hey Ty, you know, if, if you always, if you have, because as entrepreneurs, sometimes you have the, the option of having a, a huge amount of cash sitting around. Sure. Right. So it's like, 2% on cash that's sitting in the bank or 2% on something that's going to be used for something mm -hmm. or 9% on it. Right? right. So it took him a while of chipping at my ego and chipping at everything else before I finally said, okay, it makes a little bit of sense. Um, but I've always been interested in the stock market, man. My mom got me interested in it when I was like 19, 18 years old. So I've always been invested in the stock market at some point, but not super heavily invested in it because I've always been able to take that same amount of money 
let's say if I was going to invest 500 bucks, I was yeah. all, I've always been able to take the 500 and turn it into 5,000 yeah. or mm -hmm. 20,000 exactly. or 50,000. I just couldn't see that in the stock markets uh, at that time. So yeah. it was like, instead of taking 500, I'll put a hundred into it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I'll take the other 400 and flip it. So, yeah. But, so yeah. Chip it it away just makes sense to yeah. have it in. Mm -hmm. It does. And compound interest, all that fun stuff that, you know, the smart guys talk about. <laughs> Warren Buffett and whatnot. But yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. man. This is a hell of a conversation. This is fun. Yeah. I mean, even yeah. even the real estate side of things, I've always yeah. thought it about as uh, in, in terms of the appreciation of the real estate. And that feels very slow. But I, I always seem to forget about the fact that you can cash flow off that real estate oh, in the yeah. meantime and actually have the mortgage paid for. So yeah, it's a physical asset now. Yeah. You know, you have the digital covered, but you might as well start getting, you know, something that it's going to be needed. Yeah, Everyone right. needs a place to live. Yeah. You know? And so, I guess on the stock 100%. side, the equivalent would be finding stocks that pay out, you know, fairly frequent dividends. Now mm -hmm. that's kind of a passive cash flow. Mm -hmm. And you're a little less concerned about the raise in the value of the stock because you know, you're actually cash flowing off of the stock as well. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much my investment strategy is I only invest in dividend yielding stocks because I want the passive cash flow and I'm less paying attention to how much that stock is growing. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, like, with, so, so that was my approach too with, um, real estate as well but then switch our mentors right like stuff like this like that we're in now this can easy easily generates 15 or so grand uh a month mm -hmm. right yeah. whereas the mortgage on is 1800 bucks yeah. it's ridiculous it's right yeah so it's like you can go in you hire uh we've got a management team mm -hmm. that manages it that manages the rentals manages the cleaning of everything manages the uh, maintenance and you pay them 10%, mm -hmm. right? So you could pay them 10% of your net, not gross, right? So after everything, all of your expenses and all. Then again, it becomes hands off. So it's just looking at, we're in an age right now where there's just so many ways to make money in a passive way, but it's just like mind boggling, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But you have to get that first thing up that gives you uh, but, but, but two Fs, right? And that is the freedom of finances and then the freedom of time. So freedom of finances, freedom of time. So that you can now go in and start looking at all of the other things that um, are out there, like the NFTs, like yeah. crypto, like short term rentals or traditional real estate and everything else. So yeah. um, but it's getting that first thing up and running and staying focused and doing so. That's a that's a maybe that's a good spot to end this puppy, huh? Because we we went all over the fact, yeah. But entrepreneurs, I think that's a great thing to just ground yourself in yeah. at all times. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, where where can yeah. people uh, who want to dive deeper down the Tycho and rabbit hole where, <laughs> where where should they go after listening to this? Yeah, so if you want to learn how to generate passive income, right? You can go. We've got two things. So you can mm -hmm. go to KindleCashflow dot com, which will show you more about the processes of publishing Kindle books on Amazon. If you want to attend one of our live events and they're virtual, right? So we do uh, virtual live events, do three day events. Don't get fooled by that because the first day you are going to love it. You're going to be like, man, it should be a five day event. <laughs> you can go to kcflive.com. So kcflive.com, you come in and you'll join thousands and thousands of other people from across the planet. We get together for three days. Our next one is coming up, and um, you guys should tune in if you get a chance. So yeah, I'm on the page right now. Yeah. Well, you said, uh, what, is that January 7th? Is that the next one, or do you have a... That's the next one, January 7th, Got it. 8th, and 9th. Yep, Got it. That's it. Yep. So uh, anyone that's watching this or listening to this, you can get a free ticket by going to kcflive.com. So awesome. Sweet. Boom. Thanks, Ty. Yeah. Man, love what you're doing, man. I'm happy we got to connect and chat about it all man it seems like there's probably a lot more but man you covered a lot yeah. thank you appreciate yeah, absolutely. it man. appreciate the time all right guys all right great show appreciate yeah. it as thank well thank you awesome i hope you enjoyed that episode that was definitely one of the more tactical episodes we had in a while i think we've got a full blueprint on how to make a kindle book and how to actually launch and grow a kindle book and also how to grow your wealth off the money you're making off your kindle books if that's what you decide to do with your money so really 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 great episode thanks so much to ty Cohen for hanging out with us it was a phenomenal one i'm sure we'll be talking to him again in the future and uh, i want to give a couple quick shout outs before we wrap up this episode if you don't already, make sure that you go and grab Easy Webinar. It is the best webinar platform out there. It is the easiest webinar platform out there. It does the automated webinars, the hybrid webinars, the live webinars. It does all of the webinars. It builds the landing pages for you. It helps collect the leads for you. It keeps all the analytics for you in the back end. It is an all-in-one amazing webinar platform. And Easy Webinar is hooking up Hustle and Flowchart 
listeners. So if you go to easywebinar.com slash hustle, you'll get a discount just because you're a listener of Hustle and Flowchart. So again, that's easywebinar.com slash hustle. Go grab that. And final reminder, you can grab the notes from this episode by going to hustleandflowchart.com slash notes. You get the full Cliff Notes breakdown, all the action steps, everything we talked about in this episode will be available over there, hustleandflowchart.com slash notes. Thanks again so much for listening, watching, wherever you're paying attention to this episode. We really, really, really appreciate you tuning in. Share this episode with somebody that you think could get some great value out of it. If you know somebody that's doing Kindle books, somebody that's looking for a side hustle to make some extra money online, shoot them this episode. Let them know that uh, there is really, really cool and fun ways to make money online using things like Kindle books. So point them to this episode, grab the notes, hustleandflowchart.com slash notes. And uh, that's, all. that's it. I'm done with my calls to action for this one. Thanks again for listening. See you guys in the next one.